city of Manila has not realized yet the portent of the news that we are at war. Japanese bombers started bombing Port William McKinley. On December 8, 1941, Japanese airplanes began their attack on the Philippines, immediately bringing the country into what would become three years of fighting and hostilities between the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines. Members of the Iglesia Ni Cristo were not spared from the dangers of war. With the church already in many parts of Luzon and nearby islands, many of the congregations found themselves in the middle of the fighting. Nung mga nandun na kami sa malayo, sa puno kami ng kaway na, nakita namin yung baryo na susuno, pero kami nakaligtas. Pag nagre-raid ang mga hapon, punta kami sa ilalim, may, may dugout kami ganun, malalim. The dangers of war did not weaken their conviction. Their faith was always nourished through the worship services, the countless visitations, and the love they felt from those sent to care for them. Ang sabi ng kanemis, huwag kayong ano, tutuparin ng Diyos. Yung, yung pangako niya sa atin, hindi tayo maano, tinupad ng Diyos. Dinadalaw kami ng ministro na kadistino dito, kaya kami hindi nawawala ng pag-asa. At that time, we really had the chance to be among the ministers. And that's how we saw how sincere and how devoted the ministers were. I knew that they are really the true ministers. So many hindrances, so many hurdles to overcome uh, in various ways, even materially. But yet, they persevere. These are heroes of the church that uh, had given, some of them have given their life for the sake of the church. There are stories that people tell, and then there are stories that are never told, but live on in people's hearts that shape their paths and their lives. Join us in this 12-part centennial series and see what story will live on in you. War may no longer threaten the lives of the members of the Iglesia Ni Cristo, but the work of the ministers and evangelical workers continues, caring for the growing number of members around the world and bringing the words of God to those not yet reached. And no matter what part of their duty they perform, each task is performed with the utmost care, each one performed with love. So what he started doing, which I appreciate more than anything, was he would make me look up the scriptures in the Bible. He handed me the Bible and he told me from now on, when we read the scriptures, I want you to look it up and I want you to read it. And that was the biggest help for me in reaffirming what he was telling me was the truth. All of them showed the same genuine care for me and my family. Whenever my family needed anointing of oil, they were always there. Uh, when there was a death in my family, they were always there to console us, to comfort us. And even at the latest hour of the night, they labor, traveling to pray for those who need it most. And he went to the hospital that night. It was almost midnight, and he was walking with his cane. It was very difficult. I can see in his face that it was very difficult for him just to walk. But he went to the hospital and prayed for my little boy. And after he prayed, I knew everything would be well. 
So it's very inspiring uh, to see ministers with that kind of care, that kind of concern, that kind of love to show to their fellow ministers. And that's something I want to do. I want to share with our fellow brethren. When our Lord Jesus Christ was performing his ministry on earth, going around all the cities and villages, teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he was moved with compassion upon seeing the multitude of people who were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. At that instance, he saw and felt the need for more God-fearing and able-bodied men of integrity that could be depended on to carry out the work of taking good care of his sheep and the enormous mission of evangelizing the world. And that need for more workers could not have been more pronounced in his flock in these last days. My brother Ramel and I are growing up in New York. Uh, we had what many people hope for. Uh, we had every form of comfort you could expect. But having it all so many times felt like I had nothing. Uh, there would always be an empty feeling and always wonder what, what is there? What is, why are we here? What is the end purpose of our life? If I had to do it all over again, I would do it a million times over. Because this is the life worth living. This is the ultimate life. That every moment is spent devoted to serving our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It started out all just with a desire to help, especially the Latino community, in uh, assimilating all the teachings and translating for them and and visiting and helping them uh, establish Bible studies. But uh, it, it never crossed my mind that I was going to be in the ministry. That was just amazing to me when, uh, whenever I thought uh, they're going to include me in this. Uh, my God, I, can't, uh, I cannot imagine how, how important that was going to be. You, know, you can't really know uh, that you're being called by God until you receive the laying on of the hands. We accept everything by faith. What God did was to place a desire in my heart to pursue the ministry, but initially I never had plans to join the ministry. Because God is almighty and God does not lie. If God says something, He will truly deliver it. And God says, I promise. Jesus Christ said himself that whoever hates his brother is a murderer. For his mercy endureth. As followers of Christ go, therefore... Most religions also have ministers, pastors, preachers, priests, who teach, serve, and guide those in their faith. Mosea Gavias was once one of them. A daughter of an ordained minister in the United Church, her father trained her to preach. So whenever my dad was busy or he would go somewhere else, then he would ask me to take care of the worship service or services that day. So he would give me lessons to prepare, so I'll be the one preaching. Many like Mosea and her father have claimed the right to teach the words of God. And many religions offer their own training to those believing to have received God's call to preach. For some, a degree and demonstration of ability is all that is necessary. For others, no formal training is required at all. Simply wanting to be called is sufficient. 
and some organizations have created an economic venture from ordaining at will. There are Bible colleges and institutions offering degrees for anyone wanting to prepare for church ministry. Monroe Dyson taught at one of those colleges. I've always had an affinity or a love for the Bible all my life. You know, I've always felt a draw, a uh, need to be, a need to have it. And so I uh, had a chance to go to several Bible schools, have taught Bible college, and uh, was a uh, minister in my last church. Yet even as Monroe taught the Bible, he himself didn't have the conviction one would expect from those God called to teach his words. When I approach the pastor and ask him these things, uh, I get answers like, well, you know, that's something you should just accept. Don't worry about it. Well, I was worried about it, but this is my life. You know, this is my life. Brother Monroe and Sister Mosea would eventually find themselves listening to the words of God taught inside the Iglesia Ni Cristo. You know what? That's the reason. So I had a chance to meet Brother Ramil. And a uh, uh, very interesting pastor. And, and, you know, for me, with the background of uh, dealing with different pastors, I thought, you know, I need to qualify this guy first. Who is, who is he? Who is he, Glacier? And take a normal lesson, it takes about 30 minutes. And we spent about an hour, an hour and a half, just page to page to page. And he point this scripture out to, well, what about this one over here? So we're going to read that scripture and look it up and talk about that one. And, uh, and, and it was good to, it's like a, meeting a brother in the faith. Not everyone can be a preacher, you know. They have to be chosen by God, right? So that is one thing I realized, which is very true. I think to myself, I wish my dad was still alive. And I would tell him, Dad, I found the truth. It's like, um, there's like a peace that comes over you and you can't, you just can't describe how you feel when you know what someone is telling you is the absolute truth. I don't know that I've ever experienced that from any other religion where I've sat down with the pastor and most of them are like, it's almost as if the Bible is secondary and their opinion is more important than the Bible. Now to the king and eternal. some of those answers are very tough to swallow in this day and age where people want some easy answers. But, but the Church of Christ doesn't shy away from that, doesn't back away from that. It's just like, okay, we believe that this is a word of God and therefore this is the truth. He followed the words of God. Who is the that was very, very helpful, which you don't find in other religions today. It's, it's like it's a mystery. They close the book. They tell you about themselves, and and that's it. So I really, I really um, was happy to see that here in the Church of Christ, I can actually learn something truly from the Bible and not just watered down by someone else. To the law and to the testimony. Knowing what I know now, the reason why I couldn't find the right path was, first of all, um, there's one God. And there's only one true God. And the only way to know Him is to be taught. And the only way to be taught is those who are sent to teach. And I think it's one of those things that yeah. nobody could possibly unpack that mystery unless they're sent by God. In chapter 4, verses 6 and 19. In the book of Hebrews, the chapter is 9. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't mad that I heard it. I was mad that, what happened? How come I didn't hear this before? What I've been doing all these years was a lie. And I was so upset, I really was. That day forth, I 
took every lesson at face value because I knew then that there's absolute truth right here. I don't need to go anywhere else. Because of the vast number of people who still need to hear the truth, ministers and evangelical workers inside the Iglesia de Cristo hold the great responsibility to preach the words of God. But before they can go out to preach, they undergo training of the mind, heart, and spirit, a molding process unlike any other. The intensity of the training and ministry is way more intense way more intense. The, uh, the molding process is there. It was a, a spiritual process. Hindi po ang uh, pag-excel ang intensyon ng isang nag-aaral, kundi yung masangkap po sa kanya, yung ganong ugali na kakailanganin niya po sa pagtupad ng tungkulin. Those who are slackers, as we may call it, cannot remain. You really have to give all your effort, all your energy, all your time, so as to be a good minister inside the church. And um, they're, they're way in the back there. So <laughs> Life in the ministry is very difficult. From You know, you can see the sacrifices. When they were going to the ministry, this was basically every year was like uh, are there, uh, what, what, what other tests will come. I happened to, to spoke to a sister that uh, she told me that um, her son is joining the Holy Ministry and I felt so happy knowing it from her and I said, oh, it's a blessing, po. it's a great blessing from God. But then she said that um, they're worried about the things that they may experience there in the Philippines or when they become ministers. And I told, and I told the sister that you're also wealth in the ministry, the challenges, the experiences that you have gone through. So those uh, challenges will uh, make them as to workers of our Lord God, and like my wife uh, mentioned, uh, you're not a minister or a worker of God if you don't have challenges. put you purposely through many tests. And if the love is not there, it's so easy to quit. You know, at the time when he's suffering hardship, when he, has, uh, he only has four hours to sleep because he's out in the field most of the day and even at night, late at night, and this is repeated day after day, he's not gonna make it if uh, the love is not there. So we would advise them, what's in your heart, brother? Many days, students dressed in white, long sleeve shirts walk together heading in the direction of the central temple of the Iglesia de Cristo. An undertaking so great 
it would be foolish to think they could do it on their own. We were always uh, trained to go to the temple, to the sanctuary, every morning, every noontime, and every evening uh, to pray to God. And what was encouraging and inspiring is when you go to the sanctuary, it would never be empty. And we pray to God because we really felt the need to do so. And sometimes uh, the work just keeps piling up and piling up. And the only way for you to get through it is prayer. There's just no way without prayer that we can make it in the ministry. Yung pong pag-aaral po sa ministeryo ay hindi po kagaya ng pag-aaral sa karaniwang kolehiyo na maaari pong panghawakan ay yung sariling uh, talino, sal sariling galing. Dito po ay tawag po ng Diyos, kaya po sa Diyos namang gagaling ang lahat. Yung mga kaloob na kailangan sa pagtupad ng tungkulin, sa Kanya lang po manggagaling at hindi po uh, natural na sa atin. Kaya po kakailanganin talaga ng pagmamakaawa sa Kanya, uh, pagpapanata, uh, pagtitiwala sa banal na magagawa. The importance of prayer is one of the first lessons taught to all students in their preparatory year in the ministry and is part of the ministerial values taught alongside humility, faithfulness, and hard work. Making this training far different from any they would have received in their life. It's the only school that can teach the true doctrines of God. And in addition to that, it also teaches you how to be humble how to be faithful, how to be prayerful. It develops uh, the person, the student of the ministry, to become the person God wants him to be. Well equipped, not just with the words of God, but also his character, his character as a preacher of the gospel. And that always stuck in my mind. Work hard, work hard. And you know, in the Bible it says, uh, uh, don't be lazy, right? Work hard. Uh, serve the Lord, keep up the spiritual fervor. This training of ministers and workers goes back to the time of Brother Felix Munalo when he held the first ministerial class for would-be ministers in 1915 in Tondo, Manila. Prior to establishing this first ministerial class, Brother Felix Munalo appointed helpers in the early congregations of the church. They would later make up the first class of ministerial students of Ang Clase and would include Brother Justinio Casanova and Brother Federico Innocencio. As the Iglesia de Cristo began to spread to the different parts of the Philippines, Brother Felix would hold class for all the district ministers to attend. These district ministers would in turn be responsible for recruiting, training the evangelical workers and ministers in their assigned districts. Pagkatapos, sinabi niya na sino sa inyo ang gusto mag-aral sa ministeryo. Kami magkapatid, nasa kuro kami noon. Taas ang kamay, taas kami kamay. Kaya sabay kami nag-aral sa Rizal noon, sa Rizal. Talagang ujok sa akin yun. 17 years old ko noon, ay nakakita ko na mag-aral ng ministeryo. Dahil nakikita ko ang kanilang uh, pagsisikap na sila ay nag-teksto, practice preaching sa bahay namin mismo. Halihalili sila kung minsan at meron pang mag-debate na ginagawa. Kaya nakumbinsi ako na 
nag-aaral ng ministerial. As a young evangelical worker, Brother Zali was blessed with the opportunity to attend ang klase with Brother Felix Manalo. He said that we should be like a good soldier. We should not be distracted by anyone or anything, and we should learn to endure all the hardships and even sacrifice, even give our life for our office in the ministry. But he said that there are two doors, one entrance, one exit. And uh, by that, he referred to baptism. And he said that we should uh, gain more uh, and win more people to Christ and to salvation. But at the same time, guard the exit door by taking good care of the brethren so they are not expelled or grow inactive in the faith and uh, separated from the church. That I remember very well. During the time of the last messenger, Brother Felix Y. Manalo, the training is, uh, I won't say informal, but uh, the training is uh, a lot more, should I say, close hand, in the sense that uh, the last messenger, or Brother Felix Y. Manalo, has been training people um, through uh, the teaching of God's words too, okay, and uh, assigning them into various places that uh, it served as a foundation that during the time of Brother Eranio G. Manalo, a formal school of schooling had been done. Hence, the establishment of what we know as the, at the time, Evangelical College, and then officially now, the College of Evangelical Ministry. Training has become formal, uh, education-wise. Uh, you're gonna be trained not just in ministry, doctrine, Bible history, public speaking, and so many other aspects so as to make you more, a lot more effective uh, in communicating, in teaching, and in administering uh, the things that would be entrusted to you by the church administration. Because of the sacredness of the duty, the years of training and practicum is designed with careful thought. Lahat ng mga aktibidad sa paralan ay iniuugnay ng pangasiwaan ng paaralan sa tagapamahalang pangkalahatan mula sa recruitment hanggang sa admission hanggang sa pagsisimula ng klase lahat ng iyon ay may pagpapatibay ng tagapamahalang pangkalahatan Kung kaming mga naonang ministro lalo na kaming mga matatanda na ay kami ay nagtagumpay nakapanatili kami sa tungkulin hanggang ngayon Awa ng Diyos ay pinakikinabangan pa ng iglesia. Lalo na itong mga mag-aaral natin ngayon. Walang dahilan na hindi kayo magtagumpay sa ministeryo. Dahil nagdaan na kayo sa uh, puspusang pag-aaral sa paralan ng iglesia. In 1980, the first set of foreign ministerial students were admitted into the college, beginning with Brother Stephen Crow, Brother Edward Moranan, and Brother Salvador Cayabia. Since then, enrollment of young men from around the world has increased steadily. While going to the Philippines to study the ministry, when I went there in December of 81, that's my first time to ever leave the United States. It's the furthest I've ever been away from home. Before then, it was just uh, a couple hour drive. You know, go up to Vancouver. I mean, it's just like being in the United States. But now to a real foreign country, so far away, um, a language that I didn't speak, a culture I really didn't know anything about. Them. I really uh, didn't know what to expect, but yeah, let's see what happens. We just took one day at a time, and uh, 
some of us that were here from the United States that were studying together. Whenever things would happen and it's just not into the American norm, it's, it's out of what we usually are used to, we would just look at each other and in Filipino we would just say, Ito ang Pilipinas. This is the Philippines, you know. <laughs> and it was a good experience. I learned to live day by day, don't, don't worry about so much, and just uh, let God guide us. Today, the College of Evangelical Ministry has extensions in several parts of the Philippines, and in 2013, dedicated the first school for ministry in the United States. But no matter where they came from, or what steps led them into the ministry, they continued to be trained in the same manner, always with the same purpose outlined in the Bible, to care for God's children. One advice uh, an elder minister gave to me about the ministry is simply this, it's not about you. It's not about you. Uh, it's not about our qualities and our abilities. It's about God working in us. Be the person God is willing to work in. Because if God will work in us, it doesn't matter what else we lack. He also teaches us through experience. He disciplines us like a father. If God is saying, I want you to change this, I want you to take that out of your life, I want you to add this to your life, and if we don't answer that call, then it's like we're drawing back already. Yung mga bagay na uh, inaasahang gawin ay sa unang tingin ay napaka-imposible. Subalit dahil sa ang ministeryo ay sa Diyos, siya may hawak nito, dapat sampalatayan na magagawa at matatapos. This was uh, one of uh, when they were uh, every time we go Balikbayan, they're looking forward to having a picture with uh, Sister Lita and Brother Santi San Pedro a retired doctor and architect, now living in California, have always had big dreams for their two sons. As much as possible, I wanted them to follow my footsteps and be doctors. But my, fa my, my father, the grandfather, said, no, no, law, law. That's a direction they were supposed to follow. As they raised their sons in upstate New York, providing for them the best education for the future, they saw something pulling at their sons even in their teenage years. They'd sit at the doorway of their rooms and be, they'd be talking all night during their conversation. Rom Romel brought up the subject of the ministry because of the purpose in life, uh, missionizing our non-Iglesia Catholic family. But uh, Joel said, oh, don't even talk about that. We're very unworthy to go to the ministries. But like he said, when my father died, Again, that brought up, uh, they, they could have missionized the family. I have a, fa a big, large family of uh, non iglesia people. To them, it was, uh, what? Going to the ministry? What a waste. All the potential with the Harvard education. This was their mentality when they were talking to me. And I said, excuse me, but that's the highest... Uh, attainment a person can have better than being a doctor or a lawyer. Um, it's not a waste. It's actually a blessing for them to be thinking that way. The parents should encourage their boys to um, their sons, young men, to uh, pursue what can they do to help the church? We need more soldiers to handle uh, the uh, influx, the, the growth of the membership.
Ministers inside the Iglesia de Cristo are not immune to life's challenges. They, like the brethren they care for, are parents who worry about their children, husbands who want to keep their families safe. But even with those concerns, first and foremost is always the calling they uphold. I speak to my children all the time and I tell them, it's not only myself that has been called in the ministry, not only my wife, but also you too. You represent the ministry too. You have been called in the ministry too. The Lord has always taken care of my family. And in my point of view, I would feel, I would be more afraid if I didn't go and fulfill my duties, uh, even though I had to leave them behind. Sacrifices that have shaped their children to be who they are today. There are times that I don't see him for a week because he's always visiting locals. But, um, of course, work in the ministry uh, comes first before us. It's been uh, uh, inculcated in our mind as children that church goes first before us. Ang palagi pong nakukwintot na babanggit sa akin ng tatay ko ay ganito po. Ito na po talaga ang buhay natin. At buhay natin ay handog na para sa Diyos, para sa Iglesia. Mahalin natin ang Iglesia. Mahalin natin mga kapatid sapagkat sila ay iniatang ibinigay sa ating pangangasiwa pagmalasakit para sa kaligtasan. A reminder, Brother Levy also continues to pass on to his own four sons as they now share in that great work. Pinapayuhan ko rin yung aking mga anak na hindi sila dapat na magpabaya sa pagpapayo sa mga kapatid at sa pangangalaga sa kanila para sila ay lumakas, tumibay sa panampalataya, di natuto ako na papaano man yung aking mga anak ay tumanggap ng tungkulin sa loob ng ministeryo. And for Brother Angelo Santiago, seeing that love is what inspired him to want to do what he could to be of help to the church. Hindi po itinuro sa akin na dapat akong pumasok kundi ipinaramdam po sa akin. Dinaan po ako sa exposure. Ipinakita po sa akin yung uh, pagtupad ng tungkulin. Doon ko po nakilala yung ministeryo. Kaya kung paano ganun po ang ginawa po sa akin, ganun ko din po ipararamdam sa aking anak yung kahalagahan po ng ministeryo. You can be liking it to a lighthouse. Well, in that lighthouse, there's the lighthouse man who manages that lighthouse to make sure that everything is working. That's what a minister is. He's there moving that light around to show the ships, the people, the right way to go. And so we were always prayerful. God help us to be more effective. Is there someone here who is afflicted with an illness? Let us, let us consider how we worship. And let us ask the Lord God today. I remember when I was in Capitol, there was a storm. It was flooding. So we were in our room studying. Here comes our pastor barging in. He had his raincoat, his boots, and he was telling us, what are you all doing here? We were looking at him, right? In my mind, I was thinking, it's raining, it's flooding. And he goes, go and visit the brethren. Go check how they're doing. Don't stay in the room. Go get your shoes, put your raincoat, and go and check and see if the brethren are all right. And I learned that, you know. It was in those situations where the brethren need me the most. You have to go. You know, I went to Ciudad Juarez and I had to go through uh, a 
about uh, five or six checkpoints from the uh, federales, the uh, police, because of those places, how dangerous they were. And, and, and now uh, that danger is gone. The church is there. We saw the first baptism. So uh, the potential of the church is just uh, immense. And, and to be involved in, in the great work of the church, uh, there is just no words to be grateful to God. Their love for the brethren is not an ordinary love. It is a love that strengthens, endures, and overcomes. A love that is not only taught to each one, but one they experienced firsthand from those placed to lead the Iglesia Ni Cristo. Their love and their concern and their devotion their dedication. And that's the very spirit that you need to adopt. A ministerial student may not know exactly what that is until he is there and actually sees the executive minister, all of uh, the principal helpers of the church, the way they talk, the way they move and act, their faith, their principles, you will not only see it, but feel it. And so when a ministerial student is done in the Philippines, he takes that same spirit with him to wherever he's assigned. After years of training and spiritual growth, they line up, two by two, and kneel down to receive a blessing, the laying of the hands. It is the most important minute of their entire lives, and with each minister ordained, the members of the Iglesia de Cristo receive the gift of another servant of God ready and willing to care for their spiritual well-being. You leave the tribuna and you go back to your seat. The overwhelming feeling is that you are absolutely unworthy and somehow, some way, you're now in the ministry. There have been thousands of ministers ordained since 1914 each one called to help care for God's children, each one receiving a great gift and a great task. I would say that the ordination uh, is the apex, or should say the consummation of all your studies that God really had called you into the ministry. That's just the beginning. Beginning of your total and complete dedication of your life inside the church, for the welfare of the church, for the welfare of the brethren in the church that you have to administer, and of course, 100% for the glory and honor of God. Thank you. 